in fact, joining us for a discussion on uh, what's unfolding in parts of the country now is Professor Tafadzwa Mabaudi. He is a climate change expert at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Prof, it's great to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed for joining us from Cape Town. I'm sure you've got first-hand experience of just how the weather has changed over the past week or so. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I arrived uh, in Cape Town on Sunday afternoon. So, you know, as we were landing and getting off the plane, walking to the bus, you could feel the strength of the wind. You know, it could literally be pushing you. So it's quite very stormy weather, rainfall, very strong winds uh, that are being experienced in Cape Town right now. Yeah. Um, well, I I'm surprised you were able to keep your footing then, Prof, because, of course, we've seen, um, if we've been monitoring, uh, for those of our viewers who have been monitoring the, the news wires as well, um, that truck, I think it was the uh, trailer of a truck that was blown over the bridge at the Yugano Tunnel. Yeah, so that's, that's just the extreme where they were, thank God I'm a bit heavy and I've got a low <laughs> center of gravity. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, uh, anything is possible. But that's just to show you the strength of the wind. Uh, of course, with the truck, you've got the physics of it, the high center of gravity with the truck, uh, also acting against the truck's favor in that mm. regard. Mm. So, Prof, the, the question I suppose is, look, it's um, the beginning of April. Is this unseasonal weather for, um, I mean, we're seeing it uh, unfolding in parts of Johannesburg as well, although not to the extent of Cape Town uh, with the wind and the rain uh, coming together in Cape Town. But is it unseasonal for this part of the year? It's seasonal weather. So the, the weather system that is causing, uh, you know, the, the rain and the thunderstorms is a cut-off law. And a cutoff law is, is part of our natural weather system in this part of the world. We typically have them in the spring and autumn. So right now we are in our autumn, so it's quite normal to have them this time of the year, uh, as we would also have them uh, in the spring season. If you recall, it was also a cutoff law that resulted in the Deben floods of 2022. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's seasonal weather. What we can talk about really is then maybe the intensity right. of, of the system, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In, in fact, that was my next question. Um, so, yes, it's expected weather, but, I mean, winds of, what was it, 120 kilometers per hour in, in the Western Cape. We saw trees being uprooted, the roofs of houses being blown off, schools having their entire sports um, grounds, you know, where the spectators sit, that's completely been blown over at some schools. It's not safe for many pupils to be going to schools in parts of the Western Cape. This intensity, talk to us about that, Prof. Yeah, so what we've been experiencing in the recent past is an intensifying of these natural weather systems. And this can be attributed like in a year like now, where we are going through an El Nino season. So we already have above average uh, temperatures. So there's a lot of energy in the system, which then supercharges these kind of natural systems. Then you have the intensifying. But also over a long period of time, we have been experiencing that these natural systems are becoming more intense. And also the frequency uh, in between or apart is starting to narrow down. So we are having them more frequently. Uh, they're becoming more intense. The impacts in terms of, you know, what we are witnessing are also becoming more pronounced. So those are some of the things that we, I think we have been picking up uh, in the recent past, but we need to be better prepared mm. so that we are not always caught off guard when it does happen. Uh, Prof, I think you must have had sight of my questions before this interview because that's exactly where I'm going. Um, it might be expected that this is the kind of weather, although, you know, outside of the intensity, but the fact that the impact has been so much more pronounced just tells us yet again, and, and this is a story we've been telling um, since the Durban floods and, and, and long before, the preparedness of our, our, our provinces, our municipalities for the effects of climate change. Yeah, so the levels of preparedness definitely need to, to ramp up, and I think we need to act quick, and we need to act in a very well-coordinated and integrated manner. So the, the, the warning was issued, it was known beforehand mm -hmm. that we had this system coming in, 
it's a system that is a slow moving system. So when it gets into an area, it usually lasts for a couple of days before it lifts off. So those things were known. Uh, the warning from the South African Weather Service also gives an indication of the expected impact, uh, you know, noting flooding, damage to property and so forth. But the aspect about being prepared now is whether we were then able to inform people in the affected areas that, you know, they either they needed to move out or they needed to take precautionary mechanisms. The other aspect is whether our infrastructure is actually capable of withstanding those strong winds. Infrastructure is not. Yeah. So what have we been doing in the interim to do when we know that there's an event that is happening? It's what we were doing all along in anticipation that these sort of events will happen and happen more frequently. Have we been improving our infrastructure, climate proofing it? Are we more sensitive in terms of our spatial planning, where we locate human settlements, where we locate infrastructure? The level of warnings, are we communicating them better? Are we packaging them in local languages so they can understand? And have we developed the right sort of capacities in the municipalities, the disaster management officials, so that they too can respond more proactively. I think the challenge that we always have is we respond after the fact when events are starting to unfold, when we should have responded proactively before things happen to put measures in place so that, you know, if things happen, which they will, what we need to mitigate is the damage to infrastructure, property, lives and livelihoods. Certainly. In fact, Prof, uh, you've written um, extensively on this issue, and we know it from experience in our country, but it's not limited, of course, to South Africa, but it's, it's, it's sort of largely Southern Africa. Um, the impact of these weather systems, particularly being on the same vulnerable groups, children, women, the elderly, and you call it, Prof, low adaptive capacity of countries and high vulnerability levels. Yes, correct. So low adaptive capacity uh, just means that people do not have the means to cope with the situation. So because of the high levels of poverty and inequality that we still have at a regional level, uh, owing to our legacy and our history and our developmental pathways, we've got huge levels of poverty and inequality. So that adds to the low adaptive capacity. The vulnerability is then a combination of that coupled with the exposure that a lot of the poor people reside in rural areas, in formal settlements, or to sum it up, they are in harm's way. So they are exposed, they have low adaptive capabilities, which then means they are highly vulnerable to these incidences. And what we need to be doing, that's why I said it requires a very proactive approach in terms of building up the capacities of the people, uh, reducing those vulnerabilities, and some of it is economic issues that we need to address in terms of addressing poverty and inequality. Some of it is infrastructure issues in terms of climate resilient infrastructure that we need to invest in that can withstand some of these hazards. Some of it is ecological infrastructure restoring the natural environment so that it can play its buffering capacity. Trees and so forth, you know, can reduce the strength of these winds by the time they reach human settlements. We used to have greenways in suburbs and so forth. We've cut down a lot of those trees. So when wind moves, it moves through strongly. There is nothing buffering the strength of those winds. We need to improve our early warning capabilities, not just in terms of generating the early warnings, but more so in terms of disseminating them and making sure they reach the lowest person on the ground who is actually exposed and affected. So it's a multidisciplinary response that is required at a regional, national and local level. And, and you also talk about coordination and collaboration across different sectors, Prof. Are, are we starting to get at least that right? Uh, we're, we're starting to get it uh, right. I think we've so far, we've got coordination. What we are lacking is the collaboration. Collaboration is when you start to share resources. 
when you start to plan together and pull your resources. And we need to have this as an ongoing thing, not just you know a platform that we engage when something has happened, but it must be the way we function in terms of working together across sectors. Because as you are seeing with what is happening now, it is affecting all sectors. It's affecting transport, it's affecting energy, it's affecting education. If roofs are being blown off schools and learners cannot go to school, it's affecting general infrastructure if you've got things falling over. You know. So it affects every sector. Therefore, we can't just have sector-based responses. It can't be just COCTA, cooperative governance, having to deal with disasters. It basically needs everyone planning together, sharing resources and monitoring and implementing together. Absolutely. Professor Tafatsua Mabaudi, let me thank you for your time this afternoon, sir. Uh, a professor of climate change, food systems and health. Of